We talked about quantum linear algebra and a couple of um, uh, applications in machine learning. And, and I want to take a look at a very specific one, which is quantum assisted Gaussian processes. It's, it's a very good fit for the quantum matrix inversion algorithm because the conditions are fulfilled. So let's, let's take a look at how it works. But before, before we take a look at the actual protocol, which is very simple, let's take a look at what Gaussian processes are in the first place. So if you think of some very simple machine learning problem, perhaps the easiest one, just think about linear regression. So here you're given a, a couple of points and, and you want to uh, fit a line to them. The points are given in some, say, some high dimensional space. In this case, it's just two dimensions with some corresponding labels, which are real, real values in this case. And you can see that the data points follow some completely different distribution than, than our line. But we, as, as the machine learning professionals, chose the line to fit. And we don't really get any, any kind of estimate of, of how good we are other than just the raw error that we get on, on the data points. So Gaussian processes are different. They take a Bayesian approach, which means you always get some estimate of the confidence of a prediction. And uh, in, in this particular case, what, what these, these models achieve is that instead of fitting a specific function to the data points, uh, you get a probability distribution over all possible functions in principle. And uh, for any Bayesian approach, you have uh, mainly three components. Uh, a prior distribution, a posterior, and, and something to connect the two. An update rule or, or some likelihood function. So in our case, the prior is over functions. And this is a Gaussian distribution with a, with a zero mean. And our posterior is also a Gaussian function with a zero mean. But now you have this, this covariance matrix or kernel matrix as, as the variance of, uh, of this multivariate Gaussian distribution. And what's, what's going on here is that the covariance matrix is up to, up to us how we choose it. It's very similar to how kernel methods work. And what they can do, for instance, is if we choose an, an RBF kernel, which, is, uh, which introduces an exponential decay over, over a, a Euclidean distance, that would mean that these more distant points um, uh, to, a, to a curve that we are fitting are, are discounted a lot more. So they have a much less weight. And they also ensure, uh, this covariance matrix also ensures that whatever is close in the input space um, stays reasonably close in, in the output space. So uh, you can think of uh, the choice of the kernel, kernel function or, or the covariance matrix as some kind of a hyperparameter that you can tune to to fit your actual data and then you can run your Gaussian uh, process to, to get some kind of a fitting. And the forward pass, which means calculating the value for some, some point um, uh, in, in the model, is the following. So what you're interested in is, in, uh, is getting the value of the function for some data point given the data, and it will also follow a Gaussian distribution. And this has some mean m and some s square uh, variance. And this is where, where calculations start, start to uh, become important. So first of all, let me define a, uh, a vector. So we take these elements, so this is the kernel function of this x asterisk point with all the data points j. So we create a vector of that. I'm going to call that as, as k uh, actor. I'm going to denote that as, as k asterisk. And then we multiply it with, with the uh, inverse of this matrix and uh, the y vector, the, the vector of the labels. So now this is something that we have to invert. So we have uh, the kernel matrix and the, the diagonal is, is biased by the variance of the data. So this is one inversion. Then we have a second one when we calculate uh, this S-square variance of, of this uh, probability. So here we have the kernel function of this, of this point, and then we calculate the transpose of this vector, and again, this vector. So it's, it's very much like an expectation value uh, of this inverse matrix. So this is, this is the same. So what we can do now is to, to actually calculate this inverse with, uh, with the quantum algorithm. 
And so all we have to do is plug in the quantum matrix inversion routine and we get a significant advantage. And I mentioned that there are two very important conditions for being able to run quantum matrix inversion. One is sparsity and the other is that the matrix must be vac conditioned. And the good news is that both can be fulfilled in this case. So the covariance, choosing the covariance function is up to us. It's a hyperparameter. And we can choose it in a way that the resulting covariance matrix is going to be sparse. So we can, for instance, introduce this exponentially fast decay of weights so, and we can explicitly push them down to zero. So you will end up with a sparse kernel matrix, in which case we can actually uh, invert this, this algorithm uh, efficiently. And uh, conditioning this matrix is, is also not so difficult since you, you have this extra term here. And by increasing the, the variance of the noise, you can increase the values on the diagonal, which will uh, affect how well conditioned your matrix is. So by increasing the noise, you can make it more well conditioned. So both conditions are met. You are free to run the quantum matrix inversion, provided that you have a sufficiently large quantum computer.